It's time for another episode of The Sean Tabbitt Show, a podcast where I connect you with thought leaders from across the globe, digging into some of my favorite topics like personal development, marketing, spirituality, and pretty much any other shiny object that happens to catch my attention. Today, my special guest is best-selling author Mark Schaefer, and we're going to be discussing his book, Lessons, Essays to Help You Embrace the Chaos. Mark, welcome back to the show. Sean, it's so nice to be back with you. So, Mark, the last time we talked, we discussed your, at the time, which was your brand new book, Marketing Rebellion, The Most Human Company Wins. As of this recording, it's about nine, ten months since the book released. I would love to just get a quick update from you. How have readers been putting what they've learned in that book to use? It's really been overwhelming. It's hard to really accept this or even process it, Sean, but it really feels like there's a movement happening. This book is definitely impacting people's careers. It's impacting people's businesses. I thought, honestly, we probably talked about this a little bit the last time we talked, that I thought there'd be a backlash on this book. It's kind of controversial. It says that a lot of the traditional marketing processes and tactics we've been using for decades aren't really working anymore. And I explained through research and studies why, quite the opposite has happened. The response has been, I knew this was happening. I could see this happening. You just put a name on it and sort of gave us a path to go forward. And it's kind of liberating to know we can do what we knew we were supposed to do. So the book has sold very well. That's been rewarding. The reviews have been amazing. It's being used already as a text in several college classes, including uh, Northwestern University, one of the top business schools. So it's really been a wonderful response. Well, Mark, I'll just say congratulations on your success. It's a phenomenal book. And, you know, for me, I talk to a wide range of authors, some in the business and marketing space. And what's been interesting to me is, is we've just been having conversations behind the scenes about trends for 2020, things that we really need to be worrying about as we figure out how to better reach and serve our customers in the next few years. And I may just be more sensitive to it after reading your book and talking to you about it. But what's ironic to me is a lot of these thought leaders are saying the exact same things that you've been saying, that we need to be more human. We need to treat our customers like people and maybe even like friends. And we maybe need to stop looking at our data and our dashboards and not let that drive so much of the decisions that we're making. So there definitely seems to be a trend or a movement that's starting to bubble up. Yeah, I think so too. Let's talk briefly, Mark, about your podcast. The last time we talked, it was right about that time that Brooke joined you as the co-host of the Marketing Companion podcast. And I'd love to hear a little bit from you about, on the one hand, what was it like to say goodbye to Tom? Because you guys were together co-hosting for a long time and had just a good rhythm and a rapport down in your show and how you kind of flowed together. So what was that like to transition away from that? And then I'd love to hear about if you've seen any shifts in your audience, because it would definitely bring in a different dynamic by bringing on a female co-host. So how has the marketing companion shifted and changed? It was hard to say goodbye to Tom, obviously, because we're friends. He's one of my closest friends. And whenever we started the show, we really had no idea or plan in terms of how long it could possibly last. We just said, look, as long as it's relevant and as long as we're having fun, we're just going to keep doing it. And over the last couple of years, Tom's job has sort of shifted where he's become much more specialized and really is not in marketing so much anymore. And he said, look, I'm just having trouble keeping up. I think it's time to, for me to move on to some other things. And I'll give you some time to you know, think about where we need to go and you know what you need to do next. So the first decision I really had to make was, do I keep going with the show? Because I realized chemistry between Tom and I really made it. So if I was to continue, I thought, well, I've got to find somebody who I'm friends with, who I have a chemistry with, who's sort of a fun and entertaining person. And honestly, it was important to me to choose a woman as a co-host. If you look at the top 25 business podcasts or marketing podcasts on iTunes, there are no women. And that's been sort of a special emphasis of mine to sort of mentor women and help women move ahead, especially in media and in speaking roles. 
And so really it was sort of an obvious choice. Brooke Sellis has been my friend for oh maybe six or seven years. We've been colleagues. We've been collaborators. She's worked for me on my blog. I've done some stuff for her. So it was a pretty easy choice. And Brooke was very enthusiastic about the opportunity. And it's hard to say if the demographics have changed. The popularity has actually increased in terms of downloads. And, you know, I don't spend a lot of time, honestly, trying to dissect this. I certainly think people are interested just to hear the new co-host and what that's about. But Brooke also has a different audience. And she has a company behind her that promotes the show pretty well. So it could be a number of different factors, but the show has continued to increase in popularity month by month. And we actually had a pretty good spike up when Brooke took over the show as the co-host. I'm glad to hear that that's gone really well. And, you know, it would definitely be in line with uh, kind of the trend we've seen, especially in this past year, that there are just a lot more female voices coming into the podcasting space and they're seeing a lot more success there. So that's really wonderful to hear. Next, let's get into what we might call the story behind the book. Would love to hear a little bit about, say, you know, was there a certain genesis or an aha moment that got you going down the path of writing lessons, essays to help you embrace the chaos? Because this is a little bit different kind of a project for you. So I would love to hear a bit of the how and the why and what you were hoping to accomplish with this. Yeah, great question, Sean. Well, my other books, they've been epic projects. (laughs) It takes two years of researching and reading and writing and studying to write one of these, you know, what I would call epic books like Marketing Rebellion or Known or Content Code. And yet I'm also doing a lot of other writing on my blog. And I've been blogging basically twice a week, every week without fail for 10 years. And if you look at the math in terms of content consumption, most of the people who subscribe to you, most of the people who are your fans and who love you, don't see most of your posts. Kind of a good average open rate for an email might be 20% or 25%. Mine is usually higher than that. Let's say maybe 30% or 40%. But that still means that 60% of the people who subscribe to my blog aren't seeing everything that I do. And I put a lot of work, I put a lot of research into these little stories of wisdom, and they kind of drop to the bottom of the content ocean after a period of time. So I'm a teacher, and I know that this work that I'm doing can really help a lot of people. So I started thinking about how can I elevate some of these ideas? How can I maybe make some of this content more evergreen so that they're not lost on my blog forever? So the first bit of an experiment was curating these blog posts in a logical way to make a book. And the way that this seemed logical to me is that as I looked at my work it occurred to me that my blog posts are little mile markers of my journey to figure out the world. You know, what do we do about this? What are the ethical implications of this? What about the technological impacts on humanity like this? Should we take influence marketing seriously? So I'm looking at these trends and their impact on us and our careers. And I just sort of had this idea that this is all about trying to figure out how to embrace the chaos, especially in marketing. We live in a world changing so fast. And I think the ability to sort of become comfortable in chaos has got to be a life skill. So that was really the first sort of risk I took with this book. It wasn't a two-year project. It was something I was able to put together rather quickly just to see if it would work. Now, there's another interesting angle here. There was a very famous post written many years ago now, I think, at least five, by this futurist and author, Kevin Kelly. Very famous guy. Highly recommend his book called The Inevitable. Very interesting view of the future of technology in the world. 
Kevin wrote this essay called 1,000 True Fans. And it's become a very popular essay and sort of a mantra for the hustle movement or the gig movement. And he claims that, look, all you really need in your life is 1,000 true fans that are willing to spend $100 on you. You're making $100,000 a year. You could probably live pretty comfortably on that. And this has sort of been kind of a simplified view of the world. It's like all we need is a thousand fans. Now, I've been blogging, like I said, every week for 10 years. I've been doing a podcast for seven years. I speak and consult all over the world. I've written eight books. And I'm here to tell you, Sean, I don't think I have a thousand true fans. (laughs) (laughs) So, I mean, if you look at everything I've done and as long as I've done it, Writing this book was kind of an experiment because I didn't market the book. I wrote one blog post. I posted it once on Facebook, once on LinkedIn. I did a couple special episodes on my podcast, which gave away three chapters of the book to kind of get people interested in it. And the book has been okay. But what I learned is that A book really isn't going to go just because of me, just because I'm in the field of marketing. Some people may think I'm well-known or at the top of the field. Even people who are well-known in the field, you still have to market and sell and push and push and push. You'd like to think I've got a thousand true fans out there, (laughs) but I haven't sold a thousand books. for $9. So it was sort of an experiment to see what would happen if I just put it out there. And the people who love me could kind of see it. They could kind of discover it. Maybe people who've read my other books would see it. So it was kind of a low risk experiment to see if I could try to publish in a different way. And I learned a lot from it. I noticed that it's available in ebook and audiobook formats. I'm assuming that was probably purposeful or intentional just from a simplification of release perspective. It was because again, it was sort of, I wanted this to be a low risk experiment. And my original intent was to release it only as an audiobook. Audiobooks are growing in popularity and it's relatively straightforward to do. A lot of people who read my blog had sort of wished for an audio version of my blog. And what I learned when I got into it, you can't publish on Amazon without a Kindle version or without a paper version. So I had to go ahead and do the Kindle version. And people have asked me about a paper version. Actually, there was one college professor who wants to assign my book to their class in a paper version. And I decided not to do that because that is a whole nother level of complexity. You have to have an interior book design. You have to have a book cover. There are other production costs. So I was just trying to keep it simple, put it out there. One of the things I suggested in the book is this, you know, if this works out, maybe I'll come up with lessons two. I'll come up with lessons three, because I'm continuing to right. I'm continuing to float these problems out there. I don't know. We'll just have to see. Maybe next time I would do a paper version. There certainly was some pull for it. And I'll say, having just finished the audiobook, which you yourself are the narrator for that, it did have kind of the conversational sort of feel and style. It almost felt like we were getting a little, because the topics were so kind of varied and it was just like we were getting an inside peek inside some of the things you think about. It just it felt different from your other books that I've encountered so far, but in a fun and an enjoyable way. It was a, a really good listen. It's really sort of an emotional roller coaster. <laughs> 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 because there are a couple posts in there that certainly have humor. Most of the topics are pretty serious and business oriented. And then there's a couple that are very personal about my own struggles trying to keep pace with this world and embrace the chaos in different ways. And 
It covers a wide variety of topics. And I think that's appropriate because there are so many things going on in our world that impact us all as professionals that it's kind of overwhelming. And the fun thing is that the book means something different to every person who reads it or listens to it because what one person really loved or maybe it impacted another person another way. And so the feedback has really been amazing. People universally love the book, but they all get something different out of it, which has been interesting. Yeah, it definitely strikes me as one of those books where if you would re-listen to it or reread it, uh, say at different points throughout the year or every year you, you ran through it, I think you'd get something different out of it each time because you're facing different challenges and, and different things that you're going through. And you speak on such a wide variety of topics. I think people would be impacted by it in a different way when they went through it a second or a third time. You know, it's always kind of interesting with this sort of a book. It's sort of fun and also a little daunting to think of, how do I do an interview on this book? Because it's so varied. But I guess in this middle part of the interview, I'd love to just dig into a few of the topics, some of the things you said that really stood out and, and that were kind of interesting to me. One of the ones that I really liked was you talk about that there are a lot of people out there saying that 90% of all content on the web will be video by 2025. So does that mean we should stop blogging and podcasting and just go 100% in on video? Or is there still some hope for those of us who enjoy producing in these other content formats? That chapter in the book was sort of the genesis of a bigger idea for me. And it's that marketers flock to whatever's popular until they ruin it. <laughs> <laughs> and so today, what's the big thing everybody's talking about is TikTok, right? And Gary Vee is out there saying, everybody should be on TikTok. And, you know, in social media marketing world, everybody should be on video on LinkedIn. And the year before that, everybody should be on Snapchat. Well, the key to being effective in business and to stand out in this very noisy world is not conformity, it's non-conformity. If you're just a marketing lemming following some guru off a cliff, you're not going to succeed. You know, if everybody's zigging, you got to zag. You've got to find a way to maneuver in a way that nobody else in your business is maneuvering. And it's really not as hard as it seems. But it's really kind of depressing, Sean, just how everybody keeps on crunching out the same stuff. And that's where that idea in that chapter came from, is every year for the last 10 years has been the year of video. <laughs> <laughs> And everybody says, oh, you've got to be on video. Well, that's just not true. Nobody has to be on anything. And it might be right for some businesses, and it might not. Let me give you two examples. Number one, I had a good friend who told me, he gets up every morning. He and his son are big sports fans. So at the breakfast table, they eagerly look at the news from the games the night before. My friend pulls out his iPad, and he's reading news articles about the game. His son pulls out an iPad. He's watching videos about the game. My friend said, I would never watch videos about the game. And my son would never read about the game. So people absorb content in different ways. That's point number one. And as long as people read, there's going to be blogging. Now, the second point is that you really need to look at what are your goals and who is your audience? And the research shows for something like highly technical data, highly technical information and instructions, you got to have it in writing, especially if there's like a lot of diagrams and stuff. You can't just make a video about it. You can't do a podcast about it. So certain topics and certain products might lend themselves to different types of content consumption ideas and platforms. And I think there's a lot of ways to kind of mash these things together in even new forms. So, you know, the big idea behind that chapter is, you know, don't do something because some guru is telling you to do it. Let's think about it. Let's have a plan and let's do something different 
than what everybody else is doing. Next, Mark, let's transition into a conversation about your strategy to remain bot-proof. This was a chapter I really, really enjoyed. Funny you picked that one too, because that (laughs) sort of kicked off another thing that I've been thinking a lot about, and that is this whole idea of relevance in this very, very crazy world. And I think there's a really good connection between this idea and some of the ideas I talked about in Marketing Rebellion, where I stated that the most human company wins. There is going to be a place for the human spirit. There is going to be room for a human touch in our world, in almost every field. And at the end of the day, being known for that, being known for our personality, our passion, our service, our friendliness, our intelligence, our generosity, that might be the only thing we have left because the bots, they're going to be able to be answering our calls. They already are. They're going to be creating our content. We've got chat bots taking over some preliminary sales functions, at least. And, you know, at the end of the day, having that courage to be original and to insert our humanity into what we do could be our big source of differentiation. One of the things that really stuck out to me also in that chapter is you talked about that one of the ways we can remain relevant is by embracing new experiences or going after projects that might be a little different or out of the box so we can be stretched. Talk to us a little bit about that. I recently hosted a marketing retreat. It's a new thing that I'm trying called The Uprising. And I had 30 marketing professionals get together in a lodge in the woods. We met for two and a half days to think big thoughts about the future of business and marketing. And if you go on my site, by the way, businessesgrow.com and look under events, you can learn more about this. I'm having some more events coming up. And one of the topics we talked about was relevance. How do we stay relevant? You know, how do we stay bot proof? And one of the most interesting themes was exactly what you're asking me about. People started saying, well, I read about architecture. I read about biology. Someone else said, I love reading about physics. There are lessons from all these different fields that you can apply as business lessons in marketing. I hadn't really thought about it that way. And we ended up making a list of some of these sort of non-marketing related ideas and resources that could serve as inspirations and creativity as we move forward. So that's another kind of different way to think and a big idea in terms of staying relevant. One of the things I really appreciated throughout this book is, like you said earlier, you're not just talking about marketing and business, but you're talking about personal experiences and some of the things that you've learned kind of coming up through the ranks and just doing life through the years. Would love to have you talk a little bit about what you share in chapter 23. And that's when you talk about the single word that changed your life. So tell us a little bit about Bob and joy. (laughs) Oh, I was such a smart aleck in that (laughs) experience. I had the great, great fortune. Oh gosh, how old would I have been? Maybe in my late twenties, I want to say. And I went through this, I guess you'd call it kind of an executive grooming program. And I was on the fast track to be an executive at my big company. So I was in this special program with all these other young executives. So part of the experience was kind of looking at your personal history and personal psychology to look at patterns and habits that might be getting in the way of you being an effective communicator and leader. It was an excellent eye-opening program, but I went in a little defensive and a little skeptical. And you got into one of these things where you're supposed to talk about your emotions and talk about what's going on in your life. And I just wasn't sure I just bought into all that stuff. So I was lucky to have this amazing mentor. He ended up being a mentor to me that I've stayed in touch with all my life. I was actually on the phone with him just a couple weeks ago. He's now 90 years old. But back then, here I am, you know, in my 20s. And he looks at me and he says, well, Mark, you know, he knew I was struggling. And he said, 
what would you say is the emotion that you feel most of the time in your life? I just thought this was the stupidest question ever. Because here I am, I've got this career, I've got young kids, I'm trying to handle all this stuff. I said, of course, the emotion I feel most of the time is anxiety. Why wouldn't I? And I was kind of a smart aleck. And I turned to him and I said, all right, Bob, what's the emotion you feel most of the time? And without hesitation, he looked at me with his sparkling blue eyes and he said, joy. And I knew he was 100% true and authentic about that. Because this is a guy that would walk in a bar and start singing, oh, Danny boy, at the top of his lungs. He was just that kind of a person. He was just an open, joyful person in everything that he did. And in that moment, I looked at him and I thought, I want that too. I think that I just found sort of a new goal for my life. And from that moment on, I started making different decisions in my life. And one of them ended up, you know, getting off the corporate fast track and getting into a job that would mean I could stay at home a little more and spend more time with my family. And it would also result in work that I enjoyed more than what I had been doing at that time. And it was a first step and it continues to be an evolution. But I'm definitely on the right trajectory, and I started on the right path, really, in that one moment in my life. Next, Mark, let's talk about the chapter on the bank of goodwill. I liked how you talked about that, what would fill up your bank, so to speak, how that kind of has shifted and changed through the years. I think the example you gave in the chapter was something to the effect of, back in the day, if somebody left a single comment on your blog, that really got your attention. But now it might take five or six comments or something else just because your world is so much bigger. So I would love to have you talk about what it takes to put a deposit in Mark's Bank of Goodwill. How has that shifted and changed through the years? First, I'd like to just mention that if I had one piece of content or one chapter from that book, I would want everyone in the business world to read. It would be that one. (laughs) And the reason is because I think this sort of greed and hustle culture has made us maybe blind to how we should really work with other human beings. And there's nothing more annoying to me than getting this spam through the mail, through LinkedIn. And what I've been doing is when people just start selling me stuff on LinkedIn without knowing even who I am, I'll give them a link to that blog post. And the idea is that In our world, there is this huge psychological principle of reciprocity. It exists in every culture around the world. That if somebody does someone else a favor, you've got to return that favor. You just have this overpowering sensation to do something nice back for that person. So if you want me to evaluate your software, I mean, how many messages do we get on LinkedIn? Can we jump on a call? That's not that easy. That's time. That's scheduling. That means I can't be doing something else that's going to generate revenue for my business. That's a big ask. So before you just show up and say, I want you to look at this software for me, or I want to get on this call with you, you've got to make a deposit in the bank of goodwill. You've got to create something that is recognized as a favor to the other person. It's just a basic human principle. It's a basic psychological principle. It's very important to understand that in business and in sales and in marketing. And I just don't know what's going on out there that somehow there's some training programs out there that are just encouraging people to randomly spam people, specifically on LinkedIn. Now, you're asking me about the different levels of favor. I mean, this is sort of awkward for me to talk about because, you know, I don't want to seem like a diva or something like that because in my heart, I'm not, but I am a busy person with a lot of distractions. So what I said in this article is that maybe back in my early days, if someone leaves a comment on my blog, I'm going to remember that. It's going to stand out. I'm just going to be so grateful. But now I'm at a point where I've had almost 100,000 comments on my blog. The one comment on my blog isn't even going to really hit my radar screen. 
I think the busier the person is, the more important they are in the business world. Sort of that bank changes colors and morphs into something different. And I think you need to be mindful that one person's bank is going to be different from another person's bank. How would I get on Elon Musk's radar screen? I would have to do something extraordinary, something beyond my imagination. It would take a lot for Elon Musk to think that he owed me a favor by meeting me for something or returning my phone call. So there's sort of a hierarchy in this bank of goodwill. And that's the concept that I talk about in the book. I like that you said this is a chapter that you think really just about anybody could benefit from reading. And, you know, as somebody who's come up in the past seven, eight years, uh, just doing podcasting and interviewing authors of all different levels and who you have access to early on in a journey early on in your career, that's going to be very different than who you might have five years, 10 years in when you're more established. And, you know, kind of in the sense that as you build a body of work and as you build a bigger audience, people will look at who you've talked to or who you've partnered with in the past, and that's going to be meaningful to them versus kind of like what Mark described, just cold messaging somebody on LinkedIn. That's not going to be all that meaningful, especially if you're asking for time, because time is one of the things most of us have very little of these days. You know, I get pitched 20, 25 times a day. I don't even open the emails. I can tell in the first three view, three words that this is just someone coming out of the blue. Now, if I get a request from someone that I know, someone who's made an attempt to just be my friend and be nice to me, I not only open it, I always say yes. I always help people who are my friends. And that's why I think business, it really gets down to personal chemistry. It gets down to trust and working with people that are your friends. And as time becomes a rarer and rarer commodity, it gets to the point where I only have the bandwidth to help my friends. So if you're not in that category, it probably ain't going to happen. Just a couple more questions here, Mark, as we begin to wrap up. I really liked what you shared towards the end of the book, kind of looking back on 10 years as an entrepreneur, what you did right. As somebody who's dabbled in entrepreneurship for almost a decade myself, I found that to be very interesting just to hear your perspective. So I would love to have you share just a few of the lessons or a few of the pieces of advice you would give to those earlier in the entrepreneurial journey. What was your favorite out of that? You know, for me, the big thing was just the financial aspects of it. As somebody who's not planned and just jumped ship and just gone headlong into something versus maybe having more of a plan or financial runway in place before you do that, the commentary you gave about that really spoke to me, but more because I know that that can be a pitfall if you don't plan appropriately. So that's what stuck with me. That's usually the first piece of advice that I give to people who I might be helping out. I say, look, you know, maybe you got a great idea. Maybe you have a legitimate idea. Can you be broke for two years? Are you going to be able to live the life you want to live being broke for the next two years? Do you have sort of this buffer? And look, you know, I'm speaking from experience here. I've been involved with different startups. I was an advisor to a startup where I knew this young guy was going to have financial problems. <laughs> and I just followed my heart instead of my head. I helped him anyway. I got involved in this business and I knew he wasn't going to have the cash flow to be patient and build this business the right way. And sure enough, he ran into money problems. So then he started having to take part-time jobs, which led to full-time jobs, which led to the end of the business. So I think that's a very, very important idea. I think another important idea is not only the financial cushion of two years, but just being sort of easy on yourself to think about, it's going to take me time to learn how to be a business. Now, when I started my business, I had already been an executive in the corporate world for like 27 years. And yet, it took me a good nine months to kind of get into this groove and this new kind of mindset of being an entrepreneur. At that time, I was literally a solopreneur and figuring out what that means. It's a lot different than working on a team in a big company. You're all of a sudden now, boom, you're kind of by yourself. You have to have a new kind of discipline. 
You have to have a new sort of pattern in your life. You need to network in a different way. So even if you're an experienced business person, it takes time to really learn how to be your own business. I think a lot of people overlook that. One other thing I'd like you to comment on from that chapter, Mark, would relate to service offerings and income streams, because I feel like as a business grows and matures, or as some of the opportunities you have as you get established begin to change, some of the income streams and services that maybe were very meaningful for you early on might become more of a burden later on, because you just don't have the bandwidth to do all of those same things. would love for you to comment a little bit about that as well. Well, that's both a sad and happy part of success. I was fortunate early on in my business to have some wonderful smaller business companies that took a risk on me. They believed in me. We had a long-term relationship. And then it got to a point maybe three to four years into my entrepreneurial journey where things were changing, evolving, and growing. And I just couldn't afford to have those customers anymore. And I took good care of them and moved them to another person, another agency who I knew would do a good job with them. You have to be in a constant state of renewal. You have to constantly be willing to shed your skin and move on. Another example was in the early days, I was teaching a college class at a local college. I taught, I think, the first social media marketing class on the college level, maybe in the whole country. This would have been around 2008 or so. I really liked that class. I just had an emotional connection to this class, but it just got to a point I just couldn't do it anymore. It just didn't make sense for me. It didn't make sense for my business. And so I had to shed, shed the skin, evolve, move on. And I think that's a good mindset for people to always be reevaluating. What are you doing? Why are you doing? Can you put that emotion aside and sort of have the courage to take the next step and move on? Mark, thank you for giving us a quick overview of some of the things we're going to encounter in the book. It's kind of a roller coaster ride in a fun way. You touch on so many different topics. I would say it's definitely a very enjoyable listen, or if you're going to go with the Kindle route, an enjoyable read. Let me get one more quick question here, and then we'll wrap up. As you look ahead, Mark, into 2020, any marketing trends or things that are on your radar? Well, obviously, Sean, it's the year of video. <laughs> yes. Yes. Once again, video. <laughs> Once again, for the 11th straight year, one of the things that's really on my radar screen is I've been really paying close attention to the evolution and progress of chatbots and AI applications like that. And I remember I went to South by Southwest about two years ago and came back with the conclusion that this is two years away that there's some high profile applications, maybe if you're an airline or a hotel chain, but for most businesses, it's just not going to be there yet. The technology wasn't there yet. The costs were still high. The complexity was still high, but now it's been two years and I think we're getting there. I think that there are going to be more, let's say, utilitarian uses of chatbots. We're also seeing a widespread acceptance of chatbots. People aren't really put off by that as long as they work and you're getting good service. So those two trends are coming together in a way. And I mentioned that I had this event called the Uprising. And one of the leaders at the Uprising said, in five years, we may not have websites anymore. Most of the work that we do on the web could be voice activated. I'm not sure I buy into that, but I think he's mostly right that a lot of the work we do on the web is going to be voice activated. And so I'm going to be spending a lot more time looking at that in the next coming months. Mark, thanks for giving us a, a little window into what may well be the future of marketing, video and chatbots. Those are the things to watch out for. Mark, if people want to connect with you, find out more about your books, resources, the things you got going on, where are some of the places we can find you on the web? You can find everything about me at businessesgrow.com. You can find my blog. 
my podcast, my events, my books, all in one snappy looking place. Well, and like we do with every episode, we'll have detailed links in the show notes, places where you can connect with Mark and pick up copies of his book as well. It's time to bring this episode of The Sean Tabbitt Show to a close. Many thanks for being a part of my conversation with Mark Schaefer. Once again, our book today was Lessons, Essays to Help You Embrace the Chaos. If you'd like to connect with Mark, like we said a moment ago, a great place to start is his website. Once again, you can find that over at businessesgrow.com. And Mark, I just want to say thanks so much for sharing with us today. It's been a great pleasure and an honor to have you back on the show. Oh, it's been wonderful, Sean. Thanks for reading my book and being so well prepared with so many great questions.